Hi everyone. Well, hi everyone, and welcome to today's event, our roundtable with the Open Organization Ambassadors. Uh, today's panel is part of Open Organization Week at Red Hat, a time when we're celebrating the anniversary of Jim Whitehurst's book, The Open Organization. Uh, my name is Brian Berenshausen, and I'll be your host for the panel today. Uh, three years ago this week, Jim Whitehurst published The Open Organization, and at the end of the book, Jim stresses that his remarks should be read not as some kind of definitive statement, but really as sort of an opening volley uh, in an ongoing conversation about the impact that open values continue to have on the way that we work, the way that we manage, uh, and the way that we lead. And Jim closes the book with an invitation, and I think it's just worth quoting. He says, the potential is limitless, which is why I invite you to join us on this journey by engaging in the discussions on opensource.com, he writes. There is a special page, Jim says, related to the themes of this book, and we encourage you, in the spirit of letting the sparks fly, to share your thoughts and opinions with us on how you think we can all lead and work better in the future. We look forward to hearing from you there. And with that, he closed the book. And I, I really loved uh, that invitation, but I was also a little miffed by it. Um, I've been working on opensource.com uh, for Red Hat since 2011, and I knew of no special page uh, on opensource.com that covers specifically open organizations and open leadership. So as these things typically work in open organizations, we immediately set about building said, uh, said special page uh, in anticipation of the book's launch in June of 2015. And three years later, uh, we've published literally hundreds of articles on opensource.com slash open dash organization. And I do think it's a very special page. Uh, but as you might suspect, what makes it special is not what's going on in uh, that section, but what's going on around it, uh, not necessarily the page itself. And supporting that special page is a very special community of thinkers, writers, consultants, and advocates who share the book spirit uh, and have accepted Jim's invitation to gather at opensource.com to continue the conversation. And over the past three years, that community has grown immensely thanks to uh, expert initial planning and groundwork from senior community evangelist Jason Hibbets and the opensource.com team. Uh, and it's given rise to a really unique group of sharp, talented, and uh, very vocal advocates, now known as the Open Organization Ambassadors. And the Open Organization Ambassadors are the community's most invested, engaged, and powerful participants. And over the years, they've hailed from Germany, Sweden, Ireland, Singapore, Japan, and multiple corners of the United States. And they've really built something truly wonderful at opensource.com. Uh, for starters, they've helped turn Jim's single book into a five book series, publishing a new volume every six months. So I'll let you think about that for a second. Without fail, uh, over the last three years, they've composed community resources, including the open organization definition and the open organization maturity model. Uh, and then other organizations can use those uh, if they're interested in uh, the ways that openness can transform uh, the way their organization operates. They've spoken at conferences, uh, they've held panels, and they've consulted with others uh, and counseled them, really, in the importance of thinking and working openly. And today we're lucky to have three of them join us for this Lunch and Learn event. Uh, and with us today is Ambassador Laura Hilliger. She's co-founder of the We Are Open Co-op, and she's currently uh, working with Greenpeace uh, at Greenpeace requests, I should stress, uh, to help the organization become more open. Uh, she's also a member of the German National Roller Derby team. Just, I just want to put that out there, too. Uh, Ambassador Jen Kelschner is with us today. She's founder and CEO of consulting agency LDR21, or Leader21, uh, which specifically coaches organizations on principles, uh, the open principles, and works with teams and leaders to build agile environments through open principles. And Ambassador Angela Robertson is with us today. She's a manager at Microsoft who's writing on open leadership and leadership development has appeared numerous times at opensource.com. And she's currently composing a series of open organization guides on leadership, which will be included in the forthcoming new edition of the Open Organization Leaders Manual. 
Uh, welcome to all of you, and thanks very much for being here. I want to shut up in just a moment and let them uh, talk to you about the community, but I do want to say, uh, stress one more, one more thing that I think is really important uh, for the Red Hatters uh, listening to this conversation today. Red Hat's mission literally starts, or literally states, uh, that we strive to be catalysts in communities. You know, to date, we've really interpreted that mandate to encompass uh, software development communities. Uh, but as the global conversation begins to shift, uh, and as people begin to understand that technologies are already cultural, and cultural, then the cultural is always already technological. Uh, the work of the ambassadors is becoming more and more important to generating those cultural innovations uh, that are driving progress today. You know, they are, in other words, the ambassadors are, our upstream community of cultural innovators. And, and like we do with software teams, we've played a role in catalyzing that community, but that community transcends us, right? It's bigger than we are, uh, and I, for one, consider us very lucky to have helped play that role uh, over the past three years. So we'll turn to questions now. Uh, and just a reminder to everyone uh, that's watching that we are live on Blue Jeans today, and you can submit your questions for our panel of ambassadors. Uh, just type them into the chat box as you listen, and I'll make sure that our panelists get them. Uh, so without further ado, for our first question uh, for panelists today, uh, I want to start by talking about community in general. Why is participating in a community committed to a concept like something abstract, like open organizations. Why is that important to you specifically, but also for anyone in general? What's the power, in other words, of a, a community-driven approach uh, to the topic? I'll jump in. Great. <laughs> That's okay. Thanks, Jen. Uh, no problem. Um, big advocate for community, and I learn about it all the time. And I think that for me, my takeaway for it is that um, being able to talk about open or openness or whatever the world wants. I mean, that's that's the language we all use in this community, but thinking about how you bring other people into a community that aren't are not familiar with it um, is really important. But I, I think for me, the community aspect is it sharpens all of us. So we get more points of view, more perspectives, more levels of experience, more applications of the behavior behaviors and the principles. Um, so that we can start sharing on those things. So I have a very specialized way that I work, what my experience is in. But if I don't say work with Laura or with Angela or other people in the community, I'm lacking really expanding my own understanding of open or how to even apply it in ways that we haven't yet thought of. So for me, that's what's so important about having the discussions in community and not thinking that my understanding is the only way because if I don't hear applications or um, ways it's affecting and impacting other parts of the community, then I don't really have a full understanding of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Laura, any thoughts? Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that for me, it's participating in this particular community has been really helpful because I find a lot of solidarity. As Jen says, um, you know, the, we speak about these ideas in one way, but there are a lot of other communities that are using different words. Um, and having somebody to talk to that actually deeply understands this this topic and this theme um, is is really helpful in a lot of different ways. But in particular, uh, I think that as in in our work, we're sort of socially and culturally inclined to understand a command and control system. Um, and the ideas of the open organization are not about command and control, but rather about community and collaboration. Uh, so when when you find yourself out there in the world and in a situation where you're sort of pushing against these cultural structures that that we all understand, uh, having a group of people that that understand the theme to to sort of help you push against those structures in a supportive way has been massively helpful for me. That's great. That's great. Yeah. yeah well, any thoughts? Sure. What I love about our group is that we come from all different backgrounds and kind of our day jobs might be different, but our core principles are around this open organization. And I find that so uh, refreshing because it doesn't matter where we are, or what we're doing, kind of how we do it is, is something that we can talk about and learn from each other. And I really do learn from listening to the different examples and experiences that this team shares and reading the post online and the discussion that happens in the comments. So it's really about breaking through my own bubble that my, I might live in and, and really 
staying open in an ongoing way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that, that's a, a great segue into something else I wanted to ask about, which is sort of this uh, continual learning, like having a culture, of, a culture of continual learning. You know, in your travels, you know, you're meeting, your engagements with, uh, with other folks, uh, presentations you've given and folks you've met in the audience afterwards. You know, how have people responded uh, to the open organization concept and the message? You know, what resonates with people? What's perplexing to, to people still? And what helps you connect with others when you talk about it? And what challenges, uh, you know, do you face? I can talk. Okay, huh? You go ahead first, Angela. Go ahead, J go ahead Angela. Um, okay, I noticed that somebody's commenting on my audio. Is Please continue. I'm going to aim to improve it. Okay. Okay. Um, so back to the question is what I've learned is that, um, can you repeat the question? I think the audio part kind of threw me. I'm sorry. I was looking at Of course. At no, that's fine. That's fine. I, I was asking about, you know, sort of continual learning and asking about, um, you know, the, 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 your travels and meetings and presentations and other engagements you've had with folks around the concept of the open organization. Just asking, you know, how folks in your travels have responded to the notion of the open organization, uh, what resonates with people. Uh, yeah. What perplexes them? What challenge you challenges you face when you try to describe it, or what kinds of things help you connect uh, with others when you when you talk about it? Sure, I can definitely speak to that. I met in my last article that I published. This came up um, mm -hmm. where I, I I think the line that has been quoted is that people have to feel like they have to have it all together. Mm -hmm. And I think what's really refreshing about the open organization is that we can be real about what's going on. And, and talk about the struggles that we're going through in a way that allows us to learn. Um, the, you know, Carol Dweck wrote the uh, growth mindset, and that's been a topic that in different communities, it, including our community, and just always being curious about what I really like is that people know that I am really curious as our other ambassadors, and we're listening to them and learning as much from them as they are from us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Has that been true in your experience, Jen and Laura? Yeah, um, and I, I was going to add to that. Uh, my experience has been um, working with people that have never been exposed to open organization. And so uh, they often use different words. And so if you start with the word open, there's an immediate wall that you hit often. Uh, because without an understanding of what the breakdown is, if you just start using the word open, um, it, it causes this, whoa, wait a second, what is that? Is that a bunch of chaos? I mean, we can't have chaos. Or, or you know, they don't understand that it requires all these guardrails and structures. So what does it mean? So um, the other word I tend to stay away from in the conversation is using the word agile, unless I preface we're talking about a small A, not a big A, mm -hmm. um, because I, I work with people. So I work with the leadership, we work on the culture, we work on the people development side. And so these are words that, that are not understood. And so you have to bridge the gap. And often I find that the aha moment happens when you describe the five core principles, because those words are known words. And so then people can go, oh, okay, I understand that. Uh, and if you talk about the community collaboration inclusivity aspect, then people will stop and go, well, why aren't we already doing that? Shouldn't that the way, it, isn't that the way it should be? So you have to, I find for me, I have to navigate into the conversation <laughs> very mm -hmm. carefully um, and understand who I'm talking to, uh, because there, there are a lot of bridges that need to be built across our community, because we have more and more people that are uh, not in the technology world that are asking for this, they're hungry for how to do it, um, to remain, you know, either competitively um, positioned in their market, or just generally trying to address cultural and speed of innovation norms. Um, and so I think it's up to all of us in the community that understand the various word uses and applications to be really careful. Uh, I think we have a responsibility to not be irresponsible in the <laughs> words that we use. Yeah, well, and just uh, briefly, uh, Jen mentioned, you know, five principles for folks watching that might not be familiar with it. The official open organization definition lives upstream uh, and the open organization ambassadors helped write, collaborated to write that uh, definition and you'll find it at opensource.com. You know, Jim's book is very thorough at describing an open organization, uh, one we call Red Hat, but it uh, doesn't necessarily offer a comprehensive definition of what an open organization is. So as the ambassadors, one of their first order of business, uh, they undertook the, the task of writing an open organization definition. And it consists of, uh, they say any organization consists of uh, five key characteristics. And Jen, of course, just, just mentioned them. I just wanted to put that out there. And so we uh, made sure folks could, could read along at home.
Laura, how about your experiences uh, speaking about open work? Yeah, I, well, I'd agree with Angela and Jen, of course, because uh, <laughs> we tend to agree on, on these things. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think, I mean, for me, the the aha moment really comes when people realize that it is it is about structure and process but it's also about people uh and the thing that the open organization seems to in my experience um support is is really you know emotional intelligence like helping people to be okay with what it is that they're doing to trust their instincts and to and to collaborate at a level um that is bespoke to the organization, their their team, and and themselves, uh, and I think that for a lot of people, the aha moment comes when they're sort of forced to look at. I, I don't want to use the word forced, but uh, when they're inspired to look at how their own bias and their own behavior might be playing into the way that they feel about their work and the way that they feel about their colleagues and teams. So this is not just you know this is not just like here's five principles now go off and do it it's really about personal learning and and trying to be a better professional and trying to be a more um wholehearted professional in whatever it is that you're doing and respecting um the the ideas and the work of the people around you so i think the i think that that little bit is something that gets lost often because people are like oh well you know an open organization we just need these structures and these processes but the structures and the processes are there to support this sort of professional and personal development piece mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and that that raises a, an interesting point something that i know folks are always interested in hearing more about and one of the things i know our group is really dedicated to kind of ferreting out globally are these stories from open organization across industry, right? So uh, different sectors, different domains, different industries. And so I'm wondering if uh, if any of you would mind sharing, you know, a story or, or an experience uh, of when you've, you know, tried to explain these, uh, you know, principles or talk about experiences you've had with organizations uh, in different industries and how they respond to them, what they latch on to, what resonates with them or maybe interesting and creative ways that they've applied the principles in, in ways we had never, you know, considered. I have a couple of examples. I think um, one I had last year was with a consulting company. And so they use very different words, but the more that I, I talk with my colleagues there uh, and have these discussions, um, they'll be like, well, yeah, that's totally what we're doing, but we just don't, it's not really a framework that they thought of in the terms of the way that we discuss them. Um, but a lot of their, what uh, it's a, a slalom consulting based out of the US and what they do is more about how they develop and invest in their people in terms of their approach to openness is more on collaboration. Um, and their inclusivity measure that they use is really about putting the right team together for the client versus who's the most uh, senior person to put on the team. So it, they, uh, they employ a slightly different method to idea meritocracy. So it's really, if you have even a junior person um, has the right solution and the best idea for the client, that person can lead the project versus the most senior person. So their approach is really more about the, um, how you put high performing teams together and then the openness towards um, developing internally. So they, uh, they're more invested in looking at nobody sits on the bench and everybody's developed to be a utility player so we can cross collaborate again do the right thing for clients and so i've always really uh, appreciated their um, understanding of the values that we all use they just use some different language and framework for how they um they do that well, that's one of them anyways yeah sure thanks I can speak about something pretty personal and related to my job. Um, so as mentioned, I'm a manager. And so one thing that, it, um, and I work at Microsoft, and one thing that happens every year is we have this poll, and I know it happens at every company. And the way the results are distributed is that the manager gets the results. And it's really up to you as to how you're going to share that information. And so the way I've chosen to share that information is to really use the principles of the open organization, which is transparency. I share them, all anybody can see them who wants to see them. And then we sit down and I wanna listen to folks talk about the opportunities for growth. And that's the areas where basically I was lowest rated. And then I love that because it gives me a chance to see where I have bias 
that I didn't even think about these different perspectives and that the team really understands they've, you know, over time you build up trust with your team. And so they feel like they can and talk about things. And then I'm like blown away by what I'm learning. And I think it's pretty, I wear my heart on my sleeve. So they can see that. And then I'll talk, you know, after I'm listening, if I have some ideas about how kind of quick hits on how we might go for, forward, but then they know that I'm thinking about it and that we'll be collaborating in the next period so we can learn from this. And I always like to say, we need to have this open organization and these open conversations because we want to make new mistakes and boring to make the same mistake over and over again. And then I do think from that our community develops. And so I'm able to, I've been able to take the principles of the organization, open organization, and really apply it to something where not everybody handles it that way. You know, it's really hard to kind of put out there like, here are my numbers. <laughs> you know, everybody can see how I'm doing. And so mm -hmm. at, it's a moment um, and I think it's uh, really does help our team build trust and just reinforces our organizational values that I'm trying to instill. And, and what's it like sort of, uh, you know, doing that, making that gesture in a place where that's not the prevailing procedure or, or culture? Like what, what has been the response and what have you found to be people's reactions when you initially do something like that? I think it's been refreshing for the team and then i've seen others start to do the same so now i've my, my responsibilities have grown since i've been here and so now i'm a manager some managers and i've encouraged them to do the same and i said you don't have to do this and but i do it with them i you know i say here are all here's all my stuff <laughs> you know <laughs> and I say, this is what i've done in different ways and i choose to be open and i encourage you to do that because while initially feels very daunting what you get back from that is amazing and so um, they're going to really be able to grow and advance their careers in the way they want to by choosing to have this openness and i really do think that you know when i first heard jim whitehurst speak it was at quail ridge books when he was launching the his organization book and i was so inspired i was like oh my gosh this is the type of leadership i have been hungry for and i just had to trust that that was something that others would feel and that's what got me involved in this team and I do think it resonates with people when we share it. Great, thanks. I was just, um, I was just thinking about a, a couple of instances um, with my experience with Greenpeace. Um, mm -hmm. The project that I've been working on for the past two years is the first open source project that Greenpeace has done. Um, it's a software project, and um, at the very beginning, I actually used the open decision framework um, which is a resource that was created. I don't, it was created by an open organization ambassador, but I actually think it was a Red Hat people team project. I'm not entirely sure. All, cor all correct. Yep. All right, okay. Um, and so what I did was I, I wanted to convince a group of people at Greenpeace to run this as an open project because it's exactly the type of thing that Greenpeace supporters should be involved in. Uh, we're building a platform for them. Um, and so I, I actually remixed the open decision framework uh, to use a language uh, that the um, senior management at Greenpeace could understand. And it was wildly successful. We convinced them and they, they put a very small team together and we've um, been working openly since the beginning of the project, publishing regularly, having community calls, these kinds of things. Um, and it's it's really interesting because no one on the team had ever worked openly either. They all came from you know a corporate background, uh, command and control. This um, idea that you know publishing your mistakes is don't do that because nobody wants to know about your mistakes. You're going to get in trouble. Don't publish your ideas. This this mindset that people had. Um, and after, over the last two years. These people are changed. They are absolutely changed and they believe deeply um, that getting feedback from the community, that having an open discussion, that being transparent about not only our successes but our mistakes as well, that changing our minds is okay. They, they believe all of these things that we talk about um, in, in the open organization. And it's for that reason that this team of five people um, has rolled out, you know, we're rolling out sites left and right. We're putting this platform everywhere and we're so tiny, but we're able to move so quickly because we've embodied this mindset of it's okay if we fail, as long as we're failing forward. 
So mm -hmm. as long as we keep learning and as long as we make adjustments, then, you know, just keep going. Mm -hmm. And and it's been it's been really inspiring to sort of see how a group of people just I, I think that it's because they had someone to model the behaviors. And I mm -hmm. think that if you are the person modeling the, the behaviors, it's it. I mean, for me, it just feels like a huge success no matter what happens, because mm -hmm. this group of people has embodied something that I truly believe in. Right. So. Yeah, that's fantastic. It's really great. Um, I will want to move us on to another uh, set of talking points. Well, OK, move us on to another set of uh, talking points. Uh, but before I do that, we now have more than 100 people uh, tuning in, uh, listening. And so I just want to remind everyone that uh, if you're listening to this presentation live, uh, you're more than welcome to submit a question to our panelists. The, the line is open and you can type your question into the Q&A box on Blue Jeans Live and I'll make sure the panelists get it. Um, as a next sort of general topic for discussion, I want to ask about participating in the ambassador community uh, and specifically how it's impacted, you know, your own work. And we've got a little taste of that in your answer so far, but I want to talk about it specifically now. You know, how has participating in the community impacted your work, uh, your own thinking, your own projects, you know, much the way that Laura just described? Um, and how has your participation, uh, I, should, I should say, uh, enhanced what the community has accomplished or been able to accomplish? You know, what do you feel like you've been able to contribute? Uh, and, and over the history of our being together, you know, what have been some of your favorite moments or favorite initiatives or accomplishments? So I want to jump in off the back of this uh, small story that I just told. Yeah. Um, bringing, helping people to develop the belief in uh, open principles is not always easy. Um, there are times when it is very frustrating to be the person who is the true believer and to see some of the things that happen. Uh, I think that you know cultural dynamics, group dynamics are complicated. Uh, and for me, the ambassador community has been my saving grace. Um, mm -hmm. Every month we have a, a meeting in Blue Jeans and we come and I, I actually only recently learned that they were recorded. So please feel <laughs> free to go back in time and watch me complain <laughs> about some of the situations that I've had at, um, you know, in my role with Greenpeace. Um, but being a part of this community has been very supportive because not only can I talk about things that are frustrating to me, the way that we talk about them and the way that we understand each other means that I get to grow as well. Like we really have like a deep intellectual connection where we can talk very deeply about things that have happened um, that, that caused me to reflect on my own behavior in the situation and, and take it further and find solutions. So uh, I really think that for me, um, being part of this community is a, is about that exchange. Um, and yeah, so I've, I've definitely benefited a lot from having, having you guys as my therapist, essentially. <laughs> um, and in terms of how, you know, how it's um, impacted the work, you know, when you grow and when you are, you know, an quote unquote expert in something and you get to hang out with other experts in that thing, um, you know, you, it just pushes your thinking further. So I, you know, I definitely see an evolution of all of our articles over the last years. Um, if you go back and read the early ones, they, you can definitely see that we're kind of touching the waters of what does this mean? And as we go on, we find solutions, we write about solutions, we write about things that have been effective in our work in spreading uh, these pr principles. And I, I think that for everyone, it's, it's really been a great learning opportunity. Great. Thanks, Laura. I don't know if I'd call myself your therapist, but <laughs> but I I agree. I think um, the community, the peer group that we have as ambassadors is it completely has changed the way um, I approach work. It has sharpened me. It is it is like Laura's right. It's a safe space sometimes to just come and, and kind of vent and be like, you know, this is my frustration and how would you have handled it? Or did I even read this the right way? Am I too close? And so you have that aspect like you would have with any, um, you know, trusted peer group. But I think in addition to that, um, the, the, the challenging of the thought part is really what I love. Like that's where it's helped me change even my approach to how I write or how I work. Um, I think my writing completely has changed, mostly because Brian will change my work for me, or at least in the beginning, get me on the right, right, edit, edit, edit that's right, yeah. editing. But, you know, <laughs> kind of like helping you sharpen what you're trying to say, because sometimes I get in a role of what I want to say, and it, it's, 
it makes perfect sense in my head, but when it comes out of my mouth or through my fingers, it's, you know, it's just a mess. And so, um, but the, um, I think what I appreciate most in terms of how it helps us with our own day-to-day -day, uh, work environments is the pushing of thought. So I, I'm pretty well known in, with the people that know me that um, I will do anything to rock the boat of thought and make you think differently. And sometimes it's that challenge that we give each other that really, uh, I often find that sometimes they challenge me just as much as I challenge them. And well, have we thought about it this way? Um, because we need that. We need that if there's gonna be any measure of growth or if we're going to see open organization as a go from concept and something we tried over here to being this global movement, if you will. And so I think it's, uh, for me, that's really where I find the challenge. And the laughter is great. Uh, I think spending time with everybody when we're face to face as well, like we were at Summit, um, it completely changes your perception of somebody that's just on the other side of a digital screen once a month. Um, I thought Jimmy was a very quiet person. And then I find out he's got the best sense of humor and this great guy mm -hmm. and all this value he brings. And, uh, and it's really important, you know, I found my commonalities with everybody. And I think that then strengthens our community and our um, kind of the, the strength that we have that then help, you know, become more inclusive, bring more people into the community the way, the way that we see it, that it's more human at that point, not just this concept. Sure. Yeah, I think participating in the community, I think the big thing for me is it help, it pushes me to dig deeper, right? Because you can talk about this at a surface level, but really putting it into practice requires some serious thought and effort. And hearing the stories, it really is an international community with people from all over the world joining our calls. And I also appreciate that because I don't want to just have like one or two perspectives. I like having that really global perspective. That was something you said, Jen. It's across industries and sectors and geographies. And then we start talking about problems and like when we're trying to generate new ideas or talk about things, just listening to the other folks, it really does help root us. One of the questions I noticed in the chat is about silos. And I, I just think it's so easy in our lives to get siloed, to get kind of tunnel vision on what we need to do. And the community really forces me. It's like this call. I just work, you know, crazy and then but this is a forcing function for me to come and really get rooted in what what am i why how i'm doing my work because it, you know that's really core uh, yeah. yeah an accountability mechanism i think in some in some ways right i mean we like to practice open organization behaviors and and leverage the principles and all kinds of things but if you tell us in march that you're going to try something better believe in April, we're going to ask you how that thing went when you're at the call. And it's just nice to have that sort of extra level of accountability from a peer group, you know, to talk through it and to, and to want to know how, how things turned out, you know. Um, since Angela brought it up, let's, let's talk about this uh, great question we got from the audience, which is about um, organizational silos. And it's about uh, the way that you can help break down silos uh, throughout the organization, not only using open organization principles, but you know, how can you help erode silos to really bridge different uh, departments or teams uh, so that everybody is sharing and working according to the same principles? Do you have any experience uh, working that way or talking about that subject? I think um, for me, one of the most useful strategies for trying to break down silos is to be quite giving with your feedback. Uh, mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, when people out there like if you don't pay attention to what other people are doing then you kind of don't have the right to expect that they pay attention to what you're doing and i found that um weighing in giving my perspective my feedback my comments on something that is in no way related to my department my team my job my project um actually it helps people to understand that they also have a voice. And I think that it gives people agency because if they see somebody else doing it, they're more likely to, to also provide feedback. And the more feedback that you give, the more other people will give and you sort of create this nice flow of community. And, and you also um, strengthen your professional network because people, when you receive good critical feedback, I, I don't I, constructive constructive criticism on something that you've been thinking about and working with you automatically respect the person that gave it i mean for me that's how it is for me if somebody takes the time to comment on my work 
I, I respect that person for taking the time and I'm more likely to help that person in the future. That's just kind of one of those human kinds of things. Um, so I think that a big part of breaking down silos is really going outside of yourself and, and taking that first step and not waiting for somebody else to do it. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, silos are caused for a variety of reasons. So you kind of, there's, uh, two different approaches to the way I would talk about this. I would work with leaders to understand why are we having silos in the first place? Like where, where's the actual breakdown? But as somebody that's on a team and recognizing it, um, you know, there's always a few factors. Is it a communication challenge or issue? Are we not understanding each other? Is it the kind of the, uh, to Laura's point, the, are we real closed off with feedback? Uh, like where's the block at? Um, I think also recognizing that Sometimes it's not a silo per se. I want to talk to maybe a little bit more in the, the question itself that it could be um, understanding and recognizing that there's one broad culture that we all adhere to or, or values and visions. But within that, there's a variety of subcultures, especially within a, if you're working with large organizations and large teams. Um, and, and so why? It, having subcultures is not a bad thing because that's more indicative of uh, the type of people on the team, it's the type of area that you work in. Um, you know, if you're working with a lot of engineer, scientific minded people, uh, you may have a different sense of humor, you have a different way of communicating, you have different approaches, you're, you, uh, as a personality of, of people, just kind of, you know, span a spectrum of, of types of people. And so it, it may not be as understood when you're communicating to a different group of people that are more say, uh, marketing folks that are more creative minded. And so their expressions are different. Their communication styles are different. The way they want to have communication is different. And so um, sometimes we may be perceiving that there's barriers there and there really aren't. It's just a lack of understanding how to humanly engage. <laughs> and so um, that's really where that emotional intelligence piece and becoming more humane really comes in as a factor. Um, I know it is in the work that I do because that's often we're saying the same things, but we're using different words or different tones or um, approaches, um, which also the, the added layer to that is if you're working in a multi-generational team, there's a lot of misunderstanding that happens where people are not trying to thwart what's happening. They're not trying to not build community or be inclusive. We're just not using the same language, if you will. Um, and so... Uh, there's a lot of, of work that could be done at a, uh, understanding interpersonal skills and human engagement that could make all the difference in breaking down silos. So it's not always process and structures and uh, governance that's creating a silo. It's um, a lot of it just has to do with the humanness that exists. And we, whether <laughs> Sorry. No, go ahead. <laughs> oh, I was just going to say, um, I, I think it's also the fire hose of information. So I'm not sure if it's like this at Red Hat, but at Greenpeace, uh, I spent five and a half years at Mozilla, um, you know, working in big, uh, well, not as big as Red Hat, but <laughs> big nonprofit organizations. Um, there's a lot of information, like a lot, a lot of information. And so it's hard to pick through it as an individual anyways. And what Jen was just saying about, you know, it's not necessarily a structural silo. Um, I think that that this this fire hose of inf information makes it quite difficult to, to actually step outside of your own little trail of information. Um, and and I think that that's, you know, that's where the that human piece comes in is, is like making a conscious effort to step outside of your own silo um, because, it, it helps people to realize that there is other things happening in the organization. Yes, I was going to say that, you know, I, I worked at Red Hat for a period of time and I, I like the fact that we could be so transparent about everything. And I've tried to take that forward with me in other roles where we need to talk about the problems, right? Like, so if there are silos, like let's put all the dirty laundry out on the table so we can sort it and figure out, is there a purpose to this? Because maybe there is, maybe there is a greater good, even though it causes pain in the, at some point. Um, and then if there is a bigger problem that we need to solve, we have to find a way to motivate people because change does not happen unless people are motivated. And I think that's what the whole or uh, the principles of the or open organization allow me to do. They kind of give me a toolbox to go to, to be like, okay, 
they remind me, I'm not trying to get consensus. I need to collaborate, listen to people. And then at a certain point, turn that into a strategy and an implementation and just get it done. And I need the community to come together and help me get it done. So how do I motivate everybody? And it, it really is that transparency. And I think giving people an opportunity to, to have uh, participation and in inclusivity aspect of it, you know, I, it's so, it, I think people say this a lot now, so I don't want to be cliche, but it's like diversity is being invited to the party and inclusive inclusion is being asked to dance. And it really is about helping people understand how they, why they would want to break down these silos and how they can help break them down. And at the end of the day, if they don't get broken down, maybe it's not the right time for that change and being willing to say, okay, not today or not right now, but holding it in the back of your mind that maybe later you'll be able to affect some change to break down the silos. Because it's so disheartening when you know you feel like you see it's so obvious. Why do we need this crazy silo that we've erected? This is a man, you know, a problem we've created. Why can't we solve it? Uh, but sometimes it's just a matter of timing. But keep talking about it. Yeah. Thanks for that question uh, from our audience. Really good one, one that we talk about a lot and we'll continue to talk about, I'm sure. Um, I want to talk a little bit now about uh, the future of this thing we call the open organization as a concept. You know, where is it headed? Um, the, mu the movement, the community, the concept itself, you know, what are its futures? What are its next frontiers? What, what uh, uh, challenges await us as a community? Uh, and what should we be focused on next? You know, how does, how do we, how do we win? How does open win in other words, if that's even a, if that's even a goal and what is, what does it look like for us to succeed? I'm going to jump in real quick. Okay. Please do. <laughs> uh, quickly, because uh, this is something I talk about almost on a daily basis, 24 mm -hmm. seven, I think. Um, so I think next steps or where it's going, does it have a future? It absolutely has a future. I am a firm believer that um, open principles when combined with the right understanding and with the right competencies that people are given to how to apply them and use them. and operationalize them um, is how we are able to meet um, the speed of innovation. It's only going to continue to increase if we don't empower people with the competencies and skills of openness. Um, I think we'll start to see uh, not just the continual churn from an employment standpoint, people getting burned out, but I think we'll start to see businesses disappear because they're not able to meet the demands of speed of innovation, which can be addressed through the agility small a, that comes with understanding the competencies of the principles and the values behind open. Um, I think what's going to be really, really, really key for those of us in the community today is understanding that it's time to go deeper with this. So we have to start building those bridges externally with other uh, outside of Red Hat, outside of uh, the client base that you currently have, um, because what I'm seeing, this is just based off of just say the last month of conversation since Summit, is um, more and more people are in Europe in particular, and I know Laura can don't totally speak to this, but you're having conversations around regulation changes around the word open, like open banking, open, uh, open data, open government, et cetera. And so they're just now starting to go, <laughs> How do we how do we do this internally? What does that look like for our leaders and for our team? And I literally had somebody contact me from Europe that said, we know nothing about this open organization you keep talking about, but we just Googled the two words, open and <laughs> organization, because we have an initiative we have to comply with in the EU. And then we just found this page on open source and that's how we found your name. And so we just thought we'd call you. And I'm like, great, I hope that happens every day. But the <laughs> <laughs> but what that what that tells me is that there are words like open initiative being used particularly particularly in uh, Europe right now. And now you have business leaders and thought leaders going, ooh, what does that mean? How do we do open plus people? And so I think that, you know, we've been laying the found work, this community or foundation, this community has been laying and it's time for, um, you know, that next level. So I, so I totally agree there's a future in it. And I think it's just more responsibility in our community to say, hey, this is the best approach. Um, these are you know, tested approaches, and now we can help, you know, go deeper and build on that um, for people that have no idea what open source is. And I think that's the beauty of a movement, if you will, that could be a part of this. Great. I would just add that I, and you know, we've talked about it several times over the last 45 minutes or so, but this idea of bridging communities um, is one that I'm very, very interested in. 
because I'm a member of the co-op community. There is a huge co-op movement happening in the world today where people are organizing businesses, not for shareholders, but for workers, um, completely worker owned. And it's not just grocery stores and, you know, like hippie food stands, it's digital uh, digital agencies, consultancies, like it's really gaining traction and speed and is responsible for $760 trillion uh, in a year. This this thing that everybody has been ignoring for 175 years. Um, and the co-op movement, they have seven international principles that are essentially the same thing using different words. So it is open principles and the way that they talk about their work again, using different semantics to say the same thing. Um, and, you know, there's there's this parallel movement happening and it's the same with environmentalism. You know, the environmental uh, communities, activist communities, advocates for all different kinds of social justice projects, they are also talking about how can we, you know, as a group of people reach our goals in a way that is, you know, that is respectful of the people involved. And they're talking about this stuff too. So I think um, for me, I see several different movements happening. Um, and I think that it's part of our responsibility as as Jen would say to to actually bridge that gap and to do everything that we can to to make sure that these other movements are supported in the way that they need to be supported. Um, and I think that the ambassadors are a group of people that can really see those similarities and and try to bring them together um which makes the movement stronger because then it's not three or five or 12 it's it's one thing um and on that note i think a big piece of it is is um you know re releasing ourselves from the well my thing is just a little bit different so it's completely different mindset um, and really looking for ways to to kind of join together because I think um, the stuff that we're doing, all of these different communities are doing are, are you know, with the end goal of creating a, a better, more equitable world. Mm -hmm. Angela, any thoughts on the future? Sure, absolutely. I was thinking about privacy and how the open organization really is a great way to participate and engage without risking your privacy because it's up to you as to the transparency and that you um, engage in and the collaboration and so i think that what people attracts people is more that the more they learn about the open organization they're like i get control over what i'm doing and how i'm going to do it and no one's like taking that from me because i do think people are having this fatigue around like people selling their data and and like this privacy risk and so i think that's going to be an interesting component of our neck as we move forward is thinking about privacy and how you can be open and not lose your privacy and so i just think that's something i'm curious about Here's ahead. So Angela, I'll just let you know that there is a card on our editorial board that's called um, if you're so open, how, like how can you be private or something like that, that I put there like two years ago and you are welcome yeah. to write that post. Um, <laughs> I, can't I look at it on a weekly basis and just say, oh, yeah. I hope something will write that soon. Yeah, if you're so open, why are you a privacy nut, I believe is. Yeah, the, that's what it is. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yep. So okay, article it's time coming to write soon. that one. Angela just got signed up. This is how things work in the community, by the way. People have ideas and they get signed up to write articles. So, um, We have a question uh, in the chat uh, around open leadership, which I think is a natural extension of, of the point Angela was just making about individual behaviors and choices. Uh, and so the question is, you know, can you share some insights into the role of open leadership with regard to the open organization? You know, what might be, I'll just extend this a little bit and say, like, what might be the characteristics of open leadership or what, what does it mean to be an open leader uh, in an open organization? Ooh, I think we're all going to have a lot to say on this one. <laughs> I think so, yeah. Um, Angela, did you want to start? I didn't want to cut you off. <laughs> yeah, I can. Um... I can speak to this. I really try every day. That's like my goal is to deliver open leadership. I mentioned that I'm a manager and I um, I think that in it, a manager is more than just a manager. It's a leader. Everybody has the opportunity to be a leader. So I don't I want to really open this up for anybody in any organization to come in and um, 
really think about what's the problem that needs to be solved and what perspective can I give on that and how can I Im impact and become like a, a positive impact for this bigger world that's impacted by the problem. Um, and so I, I just, I don't, it's like I have so many thoughts about this. I'm trying to figure out the best way to put uh, the words, but don't be worried about trying to solve the problem all at once. Find a way that you can deliver leadership in your own way, because everybody can be a leader. There is some unique perspective that you give and you should feel empowered to speak about that. Um, lead by example and people will notice. Uh, I was talking to somebody earlier today who was like, well, I haven't been told. And I said, I don't want, but you have your own mind, you know, like I, I really want people to feel like they can be innovative and it is risky. I mean, we write about this at times where it is risky to kind of go out there and be you and be different. I was talking to an investor last week and about how it can be unnerving to be different right? Because we want to grow our careers and, and there's been this legacy of ideas around just follow the mo model. But what I see in industry, all industries, is that the model is getting blown up and it's getting reinvented. And that's what Jim talks about. I feel like that was the genesis of this movement and why I'm still here because I want to keep learning and growing as it grows. And I'm, I'm learning as a leader and I'm also learning from other leaders. Um, and that's really exciting. I think for me, uh, when I work with people on open leadership, so to answer two, in two ways, does it, uh, what are the impacts or that may not be the full on way it was phrased, but there is an impact on how people lead in terms of open organization working. Um, and to, to reiterate what Angela said, anybody can be a leader. It's not a role. It's not a title. It's certainly not a paycheck. It's really a set of behaviors and a decision to own who you are and what your contribution is, a positive contribution that you have to give back to your team and to your company and clients and et cetera, as that, as that scales out. Um, open leadership really requires being authentic. It requires transparency and um, vulnerability. And I think those are very, very scary things for leaders, especially those leaders that have responsibility tied to, you know, performance and budgets and and things like that. Um, and I think the other critical element with that is an ability to be decisive. Um, you know, in open organizations with things often, depending on what company you're at, there's a lot of decentralization and, and uh, uh, meritocracy in terms of decision making. And people get so ingrained in that flow that they forget that somebody still has to make a decision. And so <laughs> I think that, that that often can be lacking if you get too far into, into one side of openness. So remembering as a leader that responsibility that you still have to be decisive and make decisions that are, that are right for your people, not just right for whatever platform you're on. Um, the, the, the authenticity, transparency, vulnerability piece is scary. Um, to Angela's point, you have to be, bring your whole self. Um, into what you're doing. I, I have a saying I've used for years that you have to embrace your weird, whatever your weird is, you need to embrace it because that uh, that that measure of talent or quirkiness, what's quirky for one person is normal for another. And and I think we are all, we've all experienced that uh, myself quite a bit, um, but it's uh, the more that you lean into that, the more you're able to bring your whole self to what you're doing. And it ultimately feeds the people around you because it has more purpose and excitement to what you're doing. Um, and, and really the ability as a leader uh, to be able to step out and say, this is who I am. I fail often, but I fail forward, or uh, these are the mistakes I've made, but here's what I've learned. Um, people need that. And I think we need that more now than we ever have to be able to see real, have real discussions, have real open, authentic conversations that, yep, that was me. I did that, or that did happen, but I totally own it. And here's how you can learn from it. And, and can I learn from you? I mean, I think that's important for leaders also to remain coachable so that you listen to the people around you and you learn from them in your community just as much as, as you can offer and share somebody back. And um, I always tell people, if you can cut fear off at the knees, like literally all you have to do is you just need a few seconds to say what you need to say. If you can give yourself 30 seconds of courage to do that, the fear goes away because people majority of them, not everybody, will basically stand up and applaud you for just being yourself and being real and saying what they've been thinking but didn't have the guts to do. So um, for me, that's how I, a big part of how I view open leadership and why it's so important.
Laura, anything? I'm smiling because Jen just said a bunch of stuff that I would have said too. Um, <laughs> there are three more words that she didn't use yet, so I'll use them. Actually, I think you did say trust. Did you say trust? You said trust. You said you should I, I trust didn't. the people I had to around leave you. you. Something. I had to leave you something, Laura. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, there are three. The three words are the first is trust. I think that um, open leadership has a lot to do with trust and trusting the people that you are de facto leading and trusting yourself. Um, because the fact is, is that, you know, I mean, all this messy human stuff is messy human stuff for a reason. And um, trust goes a long way with your team. Um, so trusting that people have reasons for doing what they do, trusting their expertise is a huge one for me. Um, you as a leader don't know everything. Uh, so, you know, trust the people around you. That's a big one. Uh, and then the other two words that Jen didn't say, um, she said fear, but she didn't say the other two in the dark triad of bad, uh, which is shame and guilt. Um, we humans uh, feel shame and guilt for things that are probably um, stuff that we learned a really long time ago and it's just kind of stuck in our brain that we are, you know, should be ashamed for X or feel guilty about Y. Um, I think that if you feel fear, shame or guilt and you actually take the time to look at that and think about why you feel that feeling, it goes a long way to leadership because you get to know yourself better um, and you can sort of navigate situations that make you feel that way if you understand why you would feel ashamed about anything about something about when somebody says something and you feel shame uh, if you understand that then you're less likely to do it to other people and your teams will be so much stronger if they don't have to deal with those three emotions some great parting advice. And with that, I believe we are out of time. So it's been lovely. Uh, thank you to our open organization ambassadors, Angela Robertson, Jen Kelschner, and Laura Hilliger. Thanks so much for being here today and for your time and helping us wrap up uh, Open Organization Week here at Red Hat on such a strong and compelling uh, and ex inspiring note. Uh, just uh, uh, a note to everybody uh, watching that uh, you can find the Open Organization Ambassadors at opensource.com. So connect with them there. You can also find them and their work on GitHub. Just search for the Open Organization Ambassadors on GitHub to find their working documents uh, and uh, a list of the books that they're currently working on. Uh, we thank everyone for their time today. Have a great uh, rest of your Open Organization Week and a great weekend. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.